So I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. Okay, Pat, anything? Sorry. Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. What you do for your own righteousness, Old Testament like we've already seen in the past weeks, or in Daniel's 70th week in the tribulation. That's you if you want to do it. I don't suggest you do because you're going to be crying. Trust me on that one. So you need to understand there's no sealing of the Spirit anywhere else in the Scriptures except in the Pauline epistles. I think it's safe now. I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. Before we get started, let's pray. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam noten veshomerek varech ללמד להדריך הות להנהות אותנו בדרך שבה עלינו ללכת על ידי פחת עינינו אוזנינו ולבנו למען תמסור לנו מרחמתך ידיעתך ותבונתך ונראית נפלאות מתורתך שרוע הקודש שלך תנחה את כולנו אל כל האמת ברכת לימוד המילה אליך בשם ישוע. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe, giver and preserver of your word. Teach, instruct and guide us in the way we should go by opening our eyes and our ears and our hearts that you may impart to us of your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. May your Holy Spirit guide us into all truth. Bless the study of your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 So I'd like to pick up from one verse that we did uh, last week. It's in Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. Now did Paul ever preach this? The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. He never did. That is not our gospel. And that's not the gospel of grace. Verse 13. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust in his own righteousness and committed iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Verse 14, again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die if he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right. Basically said, if I can summarize this, whatever good you have done gets canceled the second you sin. Whatever bad you've done gets canceled the second that you make it right. If you live 99 years good, beautiful, perfect life, and just before you die you sin, all the goodness you've done, God will not remember. You could have lived like Hitler for 99 years, and right at the second, you say, you know what, Lord, i got to make things right. You bring in whatever sacrifices were necessary back then, and you die right after. Whatever bad you've done will never be remembered. It's the good that you've done. It's the last thing that you've done. This is what I want you to remember. Like Saul. Like Saul, same thing. So these saints are saved under Old Testament ground rules. They had their rules that they were going to. The righteousness done by the Old Testament saint did not guarantee him continual safety or salvation. It was only guaranteed if, big if, if he persevered in it till the date that he died. This seems to fall in line with Matthew chapter 24 and verse 13, which is basically enduring to the end. That's what Jesus was saying, enduring to the end. Because it is the same type of righteousness. It's a righteousness that you got to bring it to the end until you expire your last breath. The context is tribulation. There is no eternal security to the Old Testament saint. There is no eternal security to the man living in Daniel's 70th week or in a tribulation. There is no eternal security. Paul never preached that the church, the believer in Christ, had to endure to the end. Never did he do that. Never did he say that. Jesus said it, but Matthew 24, what is the context of Matthew 24? You're going to find it in the first 10, 15 verses. It is Israel. Israel is the focus. So when you're reading Matthew 24, 25, think, he's speaking to Israel. So when he says, enduring to the end, he is talking to Israel, not the church. You cannot jam the church. I'm talking about the Pauline church. Acts 8 to Philemon and jam it into Matthew 24. You can't do that. All of a sudden, you're going to be going off a doctrinal cliff. So the Old Testament saint had to literally keep up his righteousness and he had to keep it constantly clean and up to date every second of his life. Now the promise given to us Talking about the church now, was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that's Acts chapter 16 verse 31 if I'm not mistaken. This is what Paul ended up answering the Philippian jailer. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now basically, if you will do this, that is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, 
then I will do this, I will give you salvation. It's simple enough, it's an exchange. I believe and he gives me salvation. This is what we have in the church, plus minus nothing. Right, good question. I mean, in those days, comparing it today, we sin every, I don't know, just with our thoughts pretty much all the time. How did they do it then? Constantly have to be sacrificing all day long. That's why they had the Levitical law. Every sin had a sacrifice. There was an animal sacrifice that was tied into most of those sins. Some sins, there was no sacrifice. It was death by stoning. The person had to basically try to keep clean as much as possible. You need to remember, back in the day, the minds, the thoughts, they were a lot cleaner. There was no television, there was no radio, there was no magazines, there was no social media. There wasn't this bombardation of information coming in and taking over your mind like it is today. Everybody is glued to that. What do you think is happening? They're taking all of this information, they're assimilating it in their mind, and what is it that's coming through? There's a lot of sexual stuff coming through. So this is coming through your mind. But the guy that was living 100, 200, 300 years ago, this tidal wave, this tsunami of information coming at you, there was none. So the mind was a lot cleaner. So there was a lot less. So yes, they had to sacrifice their animals. Maybe they would commit sins, maybe accumulate, and then come in and kill a lamb or a goat or a bull or whatever, depending on their status. And then hoping that you don't die until you get to your sacrifice. So people, especially in Israel, they had that mentality. So they tried to live a good, clean, perfect life as much as possible. Those are the people that truly had God in their minds and in their hearts. If you remember with Elijah, he says, Lord, I only am left worshiping you. He says, no, there's 7,000 in Israel that haven't bowed the knee. So there's 7,000 people out of millions. We're talking about a fraction of a fraction of a number. And yet these people, they were walking as righteous as they could, basically like Job. This Pauline salvation now includes a few elements that were never seen or spoken about in the Old Testament. There are elements that the Old Testament saint did not benefit nor know about. Nor does the tribulation saint benefit from whatever it is that Paul spoke and actually gave to the church. He is under a new administration, a new dispensation, and his gospel differs from Paul. So in Daniel's 70th week, you're under another gospel. You're under the everlasting gospel of the angel in Revelation 14. The eternal security of the believer lies in a few foundational points that are only found in the Pauline letters and nowhere else in the Bible. A believer under the gospel of the grace of God. I'm going to read these three little paragraphs. I'm going to give you the verses. Then we're going to go to the verses. Number one, receive spiritual circumcision of the Holy Ghost, found in Colossians 2.11, which permanently baptizes this believer into the body of Christ. You'll find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. Number two, receives the sealing of the Holy Ghost in his mortal body. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19, Ephesians chapter 4.30 and Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. And number three, receives the earnest of the inheritance in Ephesians 1.14. Paul clearly confirms that there is absolutely nothing in existence that can separate a believer who is in the body of Christ from the love of Christ and of God. You'll find this in Romans chapter 8 verses 35 through 39. In contrast, the people that will add or take away words from the book of Revelation during the judgments of that future time period are not members of the body of Christ and do not possess the promises of eternal security. The Old Testament, before Paul, and after the church is raptured out of here, they do not have the promises of eternal security. So point number one, a believer receives the gospel of the grace of God, receives spiritual circumcision of the Holy Ghost. So the spiritual circumcision is going to permanently baptize the believer into the body of Christ, and we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Now here are the passages. Colossians 2.11, everybody there? In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, underline that, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened. The word quickened means to make alive. You were uncircumcised, but now he made you alive. Why? By circumcising your flesh. This is an operation that God makes together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. That's all trespasses, all sins, all transgressions, whatever wrongdoings that you've done. There was a spiritual circumcision that happened. You know what a circumcision is? It's when you're cutting off the foreskin. 
Once that is cut off, it's not part of the body anymore. Once you cut off your flesh, your soul is sort of like rattling inside your body, if I can use that imagery. So you've got the sin in your flesh. What happens with all the sin in the flesh now? Look at verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. I'm going to explain this now. Which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Question. What is the meaning of written ordinances? This is the best explanation that I found. Its basic meaning is this. A written statement of obligation, much like a traffic citation, which lists the laws that the recipient broke. Thus, it is the record of wrongdoing or guilt against that person. So there's a record of the laws that you broke and it's written on there. If you do not accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, in Revelation chapter 20, and the books were opened, and you will be judged out of those things that are written in those books. These are the ordinances that are being written against you right now. Because your flesh is still stuck to your soul. But by being spiritually circumcised then, the sins in your flesh is basically cut off from your soul. If the flesh is going down, it's not going to bring your soul with it. Now that being said, there is nothing now after this operation that God makes where He spiritually circumcises your flesh, nothing now can condemn you. The operation of spiritual circumcision which God did cannot be reversed. Once it's cut off, He's not going to sew it back on. It ain't going to happen. I say this based on the fact that I haven't found any verse or passage that can reverse this operation. So Paul spoke of the sin that was in his flesh. So the cross that Jesus died on blotted out all transgressions. Because now the sins of your flesh are basically cut off away from you. All the transgressions that was against us. So by faith we receive the forgiveness of sins, thus making us clean in the eyes of the Lord. Look at verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. As I'm going to be reading Romans chapter 7, I added a few words so you can understand what Paul was saying. Verse 15. For that which I do, the bad things, I allow not, I don't want to do. For what I would, that is the good things, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, that is the good things, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I want you to contrast this to what we just finished reading in Colossians 2.11 in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. When Paul says in verse 17, then it is no more I that do it, who is he talking about? He's talking about his soul, the seat of his passions, the real person, the real you, it is the soul. But sin that dwelleth in me, verse 18, for I know that in me, and then he specifies, that is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will, to do the good things, is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would want to do, I do not. But the evil which I would not want to do, that I do. Verse 20. Now if I do the bad things that I would not want to do, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Take this now and bring it back to Colossians 2.11 now. There's a spiritual circumcision. The circumcision is cutting off the flesh from you. Once a sin that is in your flesh, it is finished or done, it brings forth death. Guaranteed for the wages of sin is death. You finish that sin, you're going to be receiving a wage for that. The spiritual circumcision cut off the sin that was in the flesh. So the sin in my flesh, because of that operation that God made, again, it's God making it, He cut it off. This is where part of the eternal security comes in. And I say part because there's other elements that are given to us to actually seal us completely that we are eternally secure, that we can't lose our salvation. What bad work can you do in your flesh that's already been cut off? So if you have the Spirit in you, this is what's fighting against your flesh. This is where the battle is. When your flesh, you fall because you need your drugs, you need your alcohol, you need your sexual immorality, you need your food, your chocolates, whatever it is, whatever your flesh gets gratified in. That's already been cut off and this is where the fight comes in. You know that it's wrong for you because even though we've been forgiven, you are still going to fall into the consequences of what you're doing.
You go out and you kill somebody, you're going to have consequences to that. You take a dirty needle, you just killed yourself because you might go sick or whatever. You're overindulging on sugars or on food or on sex or whatever it is, whatever it is. And you're overdo you are going to get the consequences of that. You're still saved because your flesh has been cut off. But if the body of the sins of the flesh, as Paul says, has been cut off or circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, which is the operation that only God can do and he did to the believer, what death can your sins bring when it's been cut off from you? What sins could you do that's actually going to make you lose salvation? When I came to God, I came in my sins. He circumcised me. What sin can I do now to actually lose it? You can't lose it. So what sins can be ascribed to your soul now? That's right, none. Because the sins that are made, they're sins in the flesh. I think there's a verse in James. When lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. When sin is finished, it brings forth death. So once you're spiritually circumcised, you can't get uncircumcised. Again, it's a thing of the past. Your spiritual circumcision guarantees your eternal state, your eternal security. Once you're spiritually circumcised, it's at that point that you are spiritually baptized at that particular point in the body of Christ. And there is nothing that can spiritually unbaptize you. You did no work to get salvation. There's no work you can do to actually lose it. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Second point, receiving the sealing of the Holy Ghost in our mortal bodies. Here we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19 and Ephesians 4.30 and 1.13. Before I get to these verses, I want you to contrast the Holy Ghost coming and going in the days of Israel. There was no sealing of the Spirit in the Old Testament. Samson is coming to mind. The Spirit would come upon Samson, he would get his strength and the Spirit would leave and he would become a normal man. How many times did this happen? The Spirit would come upon people and they would leave people. So there was no eternal security in the Old Testament. And that's why David prayed the way he prayed. Turn with me now to Psalm 51 verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Where in the Pauline epistles, in the letters, does Paul ever say that we can lose our salvation? He is saying, first of all, we're spiritually circumcised. Now we're going to be looking at the sealing of the Spirit, something that the Old Testament saint didn't have and something that the tribulation saint will not have. Frank, I got a question for you. Yeah. How was the Holy Spirit available before Jesus came? Because I'm under the impression that He was only available after Jesus resurrected as a gift. Okay, you need to understand, in the Old Testament, the Spirit moved among men, he moved upon men. I give you the example of Samson. The Spirit came, the Spirit left. You're going to find that the Spirit was moving. Now, when David prayed, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me, what's he saying? The Holy Spirit was on David, not in David. David was not sealed. And that Spirit, he knew how it came on Saul and went away. And because he knew that he screwed up, he didn't want the same thing to happen to him for the Holy Spirit to basically just move away from David. Does that make sense? Yeah, got it. So he was always there just not to be sealed in you yet. Exactly. But he could have left at whatever time. You pissed him off, he was gone. So like I just finished explaining, the Holy Spirit came and left. The Holy Spirit came on David. He's scared now because he screwed up. He ended up committing adultery and committing murder. And according to the law, there was no sacrifice. It was death by stoning on both accounts. But God basically had mercy on him. That's where you get the sure mercies of David. David is scared now that the Holy Spirit is just going to move away from him like it did Saul. Let's get to Paul's gospel now with that in mind. The Holy Ghost now, in the gospel of grace, he's sealed within you. He's sealed within the believer. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. Notice what Paul writes to the believers in Corinth. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? I want you to turn to Ephesians 4.30 now. Watch what Paul is now saying to the believers in Ephesus. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You're sealed. There's a sealing there now. Turn with me now to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. That we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ. So the subject is trusting in Christ. What happens when you trust in Christ? 
Look at what Paul continues to say in verse 13. In whom ye, talking about all of the believers, also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. I'm going to go back, I'm going to re-explain verse 13 so you get a better understanding of what the steps are. Before I explain it, the point I want you to understand is that you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. I have not found a verse or passage where this seal could be broken, where Paul gives stern warning, you better watch out or else. Already you got a spiritual circumcision, and now you have a spiritual baptism, and now you have a spiritual sealing of the Holy Ghost. You already have got three elements that the Old Testament saint did not have. The tribulation saint will not have this, because they're going to be under a new dispensation, under a new administration. Basically, what do I mean when I say a new dispensation or a new administration? I'm driving down the street and there was this bakery. And all of a sudden this bakery gets sold and then it says under new management. So you used to go to this bakery and when you used to go there, you know that certain breads would be here, certain pastries would be here and certain croissants would be on this side. And he would have certain ways of wheeling and dealing with the customers. You walk in under this new administration, but now the rules have changed. The bread is no more there. The bread is on this side. These croissants are over there and whatever pastries now, they're on this side. Now under this new administration, the guy for some reason is giving a cup of coffee to every customer that walks in. But the old guy, he never did that. That's a new administration. It's a new dispensation. It's a new way of dealing. So when we're going to get to Daniel's 70th week, I just gave you three elements of the eternal security of the believer. What was being given under this administration, the new administration says, oh no, we're not doing that anymore. Now we're going to do it this way. Oh, but it was much nicer that way. Oh, if you don't like it, take the door. So when you walk into a place, a hotel, a store, whatever it is, it's under new administration, new staff, new thinking. What are the new rules now? So here we are now in Revelation chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 20 and Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble. It's also the time of the heathen and there's a judgment happening. And you need to understand that the judgment that's happening in the book of Revelation is for the Jews and for the Gentiles, not for the church of God. The judgment that they're actually going through, the judgment on their sin. But the church, where was their judgment on sin? Oh yes, it was 2,000 years ago. And when Jesus died on that cross, he basically judged sin at that point. And he says, anybody that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And because you believe in me, I just took care of that particular sin. And that's why it says, flee from the wrath to come. The wrath is about to come. But you fleeing from the wrath, what does that mean? Me turning to Jesus and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of my sin, really repenting, not with my head, but with my heart. You know when you're actually crying, you really feel bad because of something that you've done, and you know that you've done it to God? That's where real repentance comes in. That's where real salvation comes in. How many people, I remember this one story, we're going about 25, 30 years ago. There was this one woman that was married to this one pastor in a state somewhere. And after 25 years, she basically said, I'm fed up of this stuff. I can't take it anymore. I can't play this game anymore. And for 25 years, she was the pastor's wife. She led the women's meetings, the prayer meetings, and the bake sales, and everything else that the wives of the preachers do. She goes, I'm tired of that. She was doing it from the flesh. It wasn't from the heart. This woman was never saved. Because somebody who's truly saved, and you take that plow on your back, I'm going to keep on going forward. I might be on my knees, but I'm going to keep going forward. That's the person that truly accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. So to continue the illustration I gave you before, when you're going to get in Daniel's 70th week, there's no more free coffee. The Holy Spirit is sealed within the believer in the body of Christ, that is the church, giving him the guarantee of his salvation. Before I said I was going to explain Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. I'm going to read the verse and then I'm going to explain it, okay? In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Watch this now. Your trust in Christ comes in after you hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So first you hear the gospel. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You want your faith to increase? Hear it. Read it. Study it. Meditate on it. Get yourself around the word from a good, solid, true blue, rooted down preacher. Get around that. 
and hear the Word of God, your faith will increase. But the further away that you're going to get from the Word, the further away that you're going to get from the Bible, your faith will never grow. It might never get to that point. Maybe you're wanting to get saved. Start listening. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So getting back now, after you hear the Word of Truth, the Gospel of your salvation, Listen now, also after that you believed the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, were you sealed. So first you hear the word of truth, then you believe the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and then you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. As a foundation for eternal security, we've been spiritually circumcised. We've been spiritually baptized into the body of Christ. These are things that we don't do. And the other one is the sealing of the Spirit, that we have the Holy Spirit sealed inside us. This is something that we don't do. God will never break these three things. He's never going to reattach your flesh to you. He's never going to unbaptize you. And He's never going to unseal you. This is where we have our eternal security. Slice it any way you want. Give me the verse and don't waste my time. Make sure that it's something that it's in context. Something that I can actually wrap my head around. And understand the three elements I just gave you. These are three operations that God does. You do not do it. What you do for your own righteousness, Old Testament like we've already seen in the past weeks, or in Daniel's 70th week in the tribulation. That's you if you want to do it. I don't suggest you do because you're going to be crying. Trust me on that one. So you need to understand there's no sealing of the Spirit anywhere else in the Scriptures except in the Pauline epistles. When I came to the Lord some 38 years ago, I was all over the Bible. I had memorized so many different verses that you could have lost your salvation. I was in Ezekiel, in Isaiah, I was in Psalms, I was all over the place. I was using verses in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. You cannot use that. That is the Gospel of the Kingdom. That is a completely different Gospel. And when that guy, that preacher told me, he goes, Frank, who is he talking to? I'm not sure what you're talking about because this was foreign to me. He goes, read. Oh, I think he's talking to the Jews. Exactly. Are you a Jew? The lights are starting to go on. And they're, no. He goes, okay, so what are you telling me? You're taking something that belongs to somebody else and you want to put it in my pocket? He goes, Frank, think again. Understand when you're reading, what is the context? What is the biblical context of that doctrine that you're actually learning? This is what you need to understand. So guys, I'm going to stop it here. Have yourselves a good week. And Lord willing, we'll see each other here next week. So I have a question for you. Where will you spend eternity future? John 3.36 states, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I want you to know that God provided the way for you to go to heaven. John 14.6 states, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now is the accepted time. Today is your day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 states, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You may be asking yourself, how do I get salvation? Pray to God in your own words by believing what God said about obtaining salvation. Believe in your heart, not your head, what you are saying to God. The ABCs of salvation. A. Admit you have sinned against God and confess your sins to Him for forgiveness. Romans 3 verse 10 states, As it is written, there is none righteous no, not one. Romans 3.23 states, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. B. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and that God raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 5 verse 8 states, But God commandeth His love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and 4 For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. C. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon Him. Romans 10 verse 9 and 13 If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember, salvation is a free gift of God's grace. It is not of works. It is not a church membership. It is your relationship with God that created heaven and earth and everything in it. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 state, 
For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Receive Jesus Christ and believe on his name to be a child of God. John 1 verse 12 states, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Your choice. As Israel was given the choice between life and death, even so, I now put the same before you. Deuteronomy 30 verse 15 and 19. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Remember, Romans 6 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Acts 16 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved.